It's 30 August 1944. My hospital stay in Grotkow, which began on 9 August, was a period of convalescence for me. After the five centimeters long splinter had been removed from my right upper arm, my wound healed up pretty quickly. Instead of the unpleasant Stuka cast, I can support my arm in a simple sling. In company with a wounded Feldwebel from an Army AA unit, I explore the bars of the town and manage to get hold of something alcoholic instead of the usual way beer. The rest of the time, I'm either playing cards or reading a book. While in hospital, I also get a visit from my mother, to whom I pass on the notes I've written since I my last home leave and have continued writing while on the front lines in Romania. Her gifts of tobacco and cigarettes come at a very convenient time for me as a heavy smoker, since our rations of these items are getting less and less. 4. September Today I am joining the convalescent company in Insterberg for the second time. Owing to the tense war situation, my convalescent leave has been canceled. I can't feel anything at all from my wound. It's only a deep round scar, about double the size of the dial on my watch. I don't know anyone in the room in the convalescent barracks to which the orderly room had assigned me, but an Oberschnepser tells me that there are supposed to be some soldiers here from the first squadron of our regiment. I find some, but I don't know them. So many new men have passed through our unit recently. Many were with us for only a few days before they were killed or wounded. Some days later, to my enormous surprise, I meet someone in the grounds I had given up for dead. It's little Schroeder, who had got shot in the head by a Russian sniper in my foxhole on 1st January 1944, and whom both the medic and I had thought had no chance of survival. In spite of this, the medic had let him be taken off to the main medical station. Although his face is fuller and he has a scar the size of a dinner plate around his left ear, I recognize him immediately. It's a very happy reunion. Schroeder tells me that after he was wounded, he had woken up in the rear area hospital. His recovery had taken a long time, but his life had been saved. This is a miracle when you consider that a piece of his head almost the size of a fist, from his temple to his left ear, was shot away. Schroeder is now at another convalescent barracks, awaiting discharge. I spend many an hour with him before he is released. While we reminisce about the days at the Nikopol Bridgehead, thoughts and images of Katya continuously surface. We all had always considered her our guardian angel. We wonder whether she survived the arrival of the Russian troops. For Schroeder, the war is now over, but he has had to pay a big price for it. He will have many health problems for the rest of his life, partial deafness, irregular eyesight, and periods of dizziness. 8. October as well as Schroeder, I also by chance meet our Ober in the barracks. After his seventh injury, he was transferred to a training company in which he is still serving. I can tell that he's also had it up to here, continuously being assigned to frontline duty. Although I had never aspired to becoming a leader, the Ober managed to get me assigned to his company as a recruit instructor. 9. October The rabble to be trained in our company consists of a mix of older East Europeans of German ethnic descent, most of whom were heads of families, and naval personnel, who because of the shortage of ships for them to go to, are to be retrained to become tank infantry soldiers. Because of the undisciplined attitude of the sailors, many of whom had served in the Kriegsmarine for years, instructors who were highly decorated combat veterans were preferred, because these were the only people the sailors would respect. Even so, it was not always easy for us instructors to find the right tone of voice to use in order to get the message across to this group. 10. October. The Russian front has moved a bit closer. The Soviets are said to be on the north bank of the River Memel. There is talk that our training company will be assigned to duty in Poland, at least, in that part of it which is still free of Russians. 16. October. The enemy is attacking with strong tank units and combat aircraft from Lithuania and manages to create big salience in our front lines in many areas. Our barracks are placed on alert and we receive fresh ammunition. It is still hard to believe that we will move from the simulated war games in the barracks to serious conflict. But reality has arrived. The enemy is about to invade and occupy our homeland. What a disgrace for the fighting troops. 21 October. The Soviets are supposed to have penetrated to within 10 kilometers southwest of Gumbinen, and on the road west have reached the little city of Nemersdorf on the river Angerap. Everything in the barracks is thrown into confusion. Vehicles with officers in them dash back and forth their commands echoing through the barracks grounds. Old trucks with wood-burning gas generators drive up to be loaded with new recruits not yet trained. These trucks have up till now only been used for supply and other basic training duties. We are now loaded onto these vehicles, 
and we have to squeeze down onto the floor amongst all the ammunition boxes and sacks of wood. After a short distance, the roads are getting so choked with refugees and their carts, horses, and wagons that our column has to make wide detours through forests in order to reach the specified combat sector near Nemersdorf. We dismount during the afternoon and advance on Nemersdorf on both sides of the road. Surprisingly enough, there is no combat noise to be heard, but then further discussion is suddenly interrupted by enemy tank fire. The enemy is standing about two kilometers to our side and shooting on the street. Everyone immediately seeks cover in the ditch. Under cover of the darkness, we move nearer to the village and dig in on a small hillock. The Russians are reported to have taken over the trenches that in recent weeks were excavated by the Volkssturm and the local civilian population in order to defend the village. Our training company is going to storm these trenches with shouts of hurrah, we are told. The night passes quietly, but the recruits are nervous and can't get off to sleep. For them and the former sailors, it will be their first engagement. 22 October. A hazy fog covers the fields this morning, and the only view of the village is a few dim outlines of houses. Our company is located on the right flank and awaiting orders to attack. However, even before our orders arrive, the recruits from the other company are storming forward yelling, Hurrah! They receive heavy machine gun and rifle fire in return. I can hear lots of voices calling out for medics. As we also start to attack, the counterfire is no longer as strong, but even so, we suffer three slightly wounded and one seriously wounded from my group. The losses from the other companies could be considerable. Together with some officers, it seems that a large number of NCOs and soldiers have been killed or wounded. The enemy suffers heavy casualties in the trenches. The rest try to get away, but they are captured one by one. Out of the barracks in Insterberg and into action towards Nemersdorf. We don't meet any more Soviets as we sweep through the village. Instead, we discover terrible incidents involving mangled bodies, reminding me of the atrocities committed by Soviet soldiers on their own villagers, which I saw during our retreat in the spring of 1944. Here it is, German women from whose bodies they have ripped clothing, to shame and then mutilate them in the most inhuman manner. In a barn, we come across an old man whose throat has been drilled through with a pitchfork so that his entire body is hanging on the barn door. In one house, all the feather cushions have been cut open and smeared with blood, and among the feathers lie the dissected bodies of two women and two murdered children. The sight is so terrible that some of our recruits run out in panic and vomit. It is impossible for me to describe all the terrible sights we have witnessed in Nemersdorf. I can't find the right words, and it is repugnant to have to talk about the horrific acts perpetrated on innocent women, children, and old people. For a moment, I have to think back on what the recruit said when he saw ravens and crows and so convincingly spoke about the buzzards being over Nemersdorf. Was it a coincidence that, at exactly that moment, such a large flock of birds was in the village? Or was there more to it? A premonition, perhaps? Unfortunately, I can't discuss this further with the young man in question because he was the one who was badly wounded this morning during our assault. 23 October. After the battle for Nemersdorf, we learned that the local National Socialist Workers' Party office hadn't warned the population soon enough about evacuating the village. The people were therefore surprised in their sleep by the Soviets and couldn't escape. The party bigwigs, however, were all able to get away in time. 25 October. By concentrating strong German units, the Soviet troops are again pressed back and the front lines once more stabilized. Our reserve battalion remains for a few more days to secure the Nemersdorf area and reoccupy the strong points and trenches. This morning we are relieved and return to the barracks in Insterberg. Over the course of the next few days, there is a general disintegration of the Insterberg training area. The training companies are finally going to be deployed. 27 October. Today we're leaving, but no one knows where we are off to. A number of rumors are flying about, one mentioning frontline duty, another further training and deployment in Poland. In the meantime, some of the ex-naval personnel have been detached and replaced by former Luftwaffe personnel. Menin October. The uncertainty is laid to rest. We are offloaded in Lodz, Poland, and March, singing, through the gates of a Polish barracks, our home for the next few weeks. 10 November. We have been in this former Polish barracks for almost two weeks. 
The place is built of red brick with a high wall all round. Heavy frost has arrived in the last few days, and we have been issued with warm overcoats. Each morning we sing along while we march with the training companies through the streets of Lodz toward the training ground outside the city. This area, which belongs to the barracks, is very large and is equipped with dugouts for protection against tanks. The training for the sailors and recruits is hard but relatively pleasant. No one can complain about the food, only the tobacco rations fall short, and for heavy smokers like me they are inadequate. It is therefore hardly surprising that some of the soldiers try to get in touch with the civilian population in order to get hold of Polish papiero cigarettes, the ones with the long filters, from the black market for resale to other soldiers. This trade was not without its risks, and in one unit a warning was given out that this type of contact had already got some men into trouble. Black market trading is illegal, so it takes place mostly in obscure or uncontrolled areas. However, German soldiers are often lured into these places by Polish underground personnel for the express purpose of being murdered. Virtually every day we hear about soldiers who had been found dead or have just disappeared without a trace. In our barracks building, there have been two incidents in which recruits disappeared and were never found. According to statements from their colleagues, they hadn't deserted. 7. January 1945 there is an air of breaking up within the barracks once more, and we are driven to the railway goods station and loaded onto a train. We're not told where we're going, and the rumors are flying. All sorts of theories are put forward, although we as instructors know from the battalion commander that we will not be dispatched to the front as training has not yet been completed. We travel generally at night, and because of the continuous bombing raids on the cities, we only stop when we're in open countryside. Our journey takes us through Berlin and Hamburg and further north to Denmark. When we reach Aarhus, we're offloaded and driven from there to a small village. 10. January to 6. March Our training company is billeted in a newly built school near the port of Aarhus. We are very well accommodated and have enough space in which to carry out our training and weapons instruction. Outside, it is freezing cold and a light dusting of snow covers the fields. The garrison is well-placed for training the recruits, as it's only a few minutes to the range for gunnery practice. After our first look round the village, it's rather like being in paradise because we're able to buy a lot of things, which we've had to do without for a long time. We have taken a particular fancy to the cakes and cream puffs available from all the baker's shops. I don't think I will ever again eat as many cream puffs as I have pushed down my gullet these last few days. Our stay here in Denmark has started off really nicely. But then, a series of unexpected, loathsome, and provocative acts become the routine. And for me and some of the others, finally an unbearable torment. The reason for all this is the new company commander, who doesn't know enough about combat training and leadership. We got a sample of this the day we arrived. Because in his opinion, our company had not dressed ranks properly when the transport Fuhrer reported to him, he made us stand in the freezing cold in front of the school for an hour. Only then did he accept the transport Fuhrer's report and dismiss us. This was a pretty selfish demonstration of his authority. He made himself look ridiculous. He was a comical-looking lieutenant who belonged to the old Spit and Polish Brigade, and who recently, mainly out of pity, had been promoted from Stabsfeldwebel to officer rank. In his case, the compassion was probably well-directed, because he had at some time unfortunately lost his left arm and been injured in one eye which had gained him a silver wounded badge and the Iron Cross second class. The loss of his left arm in no way prevented him from using his right arm in the manner of a jumped-up drill sergeant, neither did it stop him constantly patting us in order to correct our body posture as we were submitting our combat reports in front of the recruits. To show us up in this way was bad form, coming from a superior in the presence of recruits, to whom it must also have appeared pretty silly as a result of his constant nagging and touching of the instructors and recruits, correcting a shoulder which might sag a half a centimeter, or correcting a salute because the raised arm did not reach above the eyebrow. He was soon known only as Holzauge, Wood Eye, to us and to the recruits. Over the next few weeks, Wood Eye gave us the creeps with his constant pettiness and fault-finding, diminishing more and more the desire of everyone to serve in his company. Once, when we were pitted against a unit of Danish partisans, who had blown up a railway line, we learned from a Wachtmeister from another company that our company commander had only been commissioned a few months ago and that this was the first company command he had had. Apparently, 
he had never understood that service as a company commander required a new outlook and a different attitude. Would I may have looked like an officer, but as a result of his childish demeanor, he was just a brainless drill sergeant. 8 March. We have been here in Denmark for almost two months, and orders come for our recruits to be assigned to the front. Even though we've been expecting these orders, they nevertheless do come as a bit of a surprise. I'm immediately faced with a dilemma. Should I remain here and let myself be exposed to the whims of a stupid officer, or volunteer to go to the front with the recruits? Following a conversation with our Ober, who very wisely keeps out of any controversies, but who nevertheless wants to talk me into staying, it becomes clear that he can't do anything to change the way the company is run. I therefore decide to do my duty at the front rather than continue to be exposed to the unpleasant atmosphere here. It isn't an easy decision to make, but it does characterize the bitter disappointment which I feel I'm suffering in this degrading situation. As I tell Would I my decision, it's clear that my leaving the company in this manner is to his personal disadvantage. In his plump, sanctimonious manner, he refers to my gold-wounded badge and my other decorations, and furtively asks if I have considered things properly, as I have already done more for the fatherland than many others have. For this, I really ought to punish Would I and stay put, but I know that it is precisely because I am a mere Obergefreiter with high honors that I bother him, and that this irritates his enormous ego. 10 March. Our training company, now designated a Ersatz Company, has boarded on a train and has reached Hamburg. We are picked up from the station and taken to a barracks. Another company arrives after us. Like us, it has been trained in Denmark, and with it is Gerhard Bunge, with whom I trained in Insterberg in 1942. Bunge had decided to go on for additional training and had, in the meantime, become a Fahnen Junker Feldwebel. He had completed his tour of duty at the front line and has been decorated with the Iron Cross Second Class and the Bronze Close Combat Badge. He tells me that our division has been fighting in East Prussia, but exists now only as a combat group. We are to be supplied only with new uniforms, as we are replacements for the elite Grossdeutschland unit, greatly decimated in combat near Stetten, on the eastern side of the Oder. Bunge is right. Back in the days when I was a recruit, I would probably have been very proud to wear the narrow black sleeve insignia with the silver inscription Führerbegleitbrigade Grossdeutschland. Plus, now the designation Grossdeutschland seems more like a joke, not least because this supposedly elite unit is now nothing but a bunch of half-trained Hitler Youth members, retrained Kriegsmarine and Luftwaffe personnel, and elderly ethnic Germans from Eastern Europe who can only speak broken German. A dreadful bunch, the like of which I have never seen, even in 1942 after the flight from Stalingrad. 14 March. We have got our new uniforms and have been issued with weapons and equipment for our assignment at the front, but having received orders to depart, we now get orders to stay where we are. Apparently there is not enough transport available, and so we're told to await further instructions in the barracks. Is this a last brief respite before the final curtain? We use the time to get to know the Reeperbahn, the infamous red light district in Hamburg, but what a disappointment. Many of the houses are bombed out. One place which provides us soldiers with some entertainment is the Hippodrome, but after half an hour, there is an air raid alarm. Everyone runs to a basement or to the underground bunkers. This is my first experience of the massive Allied air raids on Hamburg. The war is now everywhere. It destroys cities and people from the air, and the horror is reflected in people's faces, which are furrowed with fright, sorrow, and sadness. They all appear years older. The war shreds nerves and daily demands wounded and dead. It tears friendships and families brutally apart and brings them unspeakable unhappiness and suffering. Wojna kaput. Just as Katya had expressed this wish, full of desperation and pain, at the Nikopol bridgehead, so also must the people here with us have said it a thousand times, the longing that this wretched war might end quickly. But it doesn't stop. It rages on. It destroys everything around it except war itself. All the fanatics, who are now under pressure, will either lose face or be brought to book. Many people still believe them. They understand how to juggle and twist the events. They believe in the top-secret wonder weapon everyone is talking about. I am skeptical, very skeptical, because in the past so much has been promised and not delivered. But one thing I'm certain about, I have no desire to stick my neck out. 
I feel that, for us, things are moving inexorably towards a conclusion. Soviet troops stand on the Oder and the alleys are about to cross the Rhine. 19 March. Our marching orders came two days ago. Then we were loaded in a train and taken to Stettin. We came under enemy artillery fire near the railway, which resulted in one dead and two wounded. While we were offloading, everything was in uproar, with people running around like headless chickens, and we old hands were hard put to it to hold things together. After months resting, I will have to get used to being at the front again, and get used to the fact that Ivan has his claws in me once more. So how long will it last this time? And how will it all end? 20 March After a tiring march, we reach the unit to which we will be subordinated. In a large village square, we are welcomed by an officer, some Feldwebel and several Unteroffiziere, who immediately begin to sort us out and organize us, the replacements. A somewhat older major, with the Iron Cross badge of the First World War, seems surprised to see me with the fresh troops. He comes over to me and says, How come, old boy? I look at him and think that he might be right, if he means my age. I pull myself together as usual and say, If Herr Major is talking about my combat experience, then I admit I have a few things behind me. He nods and asks directly where I was involved and what I had been doing up to now. In the end, I tell him that I would feel happiest behind an HMG. The Major shakes his head. I'm sorry, but all the machine gun positions are assigned, and the Gruppenführer positions were filled just two days ago. That, of course, could mean that things become very hot for me. Disappointed, I reply, then I will probably be assigned to the front with rifle in hand, Herr Major? He laughs at my comment and slaps me on the shoulder. Of course not, he says decisively. That would be too much. Besides, I don't like to see good men go to the dogs. That sounds good, my brain says to me. And he becomes a much more interesting sort of bloke. The major pauses and I see that he is considering something. Then he asks, can you ride a motorbike? Jawohl, Herr Major, I answer quickly and with pride. I hold all army driver's licenses up to armored personnel carriers. Great, the major answers and nods, satisfied with my answer. As of tomorrow, you will lead the motorcycle courier section at regimental headquarters. Is that clear? After a few days, I will put you in charge of the section, okay? His suggestion comes as a bit of a surprise, but I answer without hesitation. Jawohl, Herr Major. What else could I, an ordinary Obergefreiter, have said? Decline? If I'd done that, I might have annoyed him, and heaven knows where he would have sent me. Motorcycle courier might not be so bad. I might not be exactly over the moon about it. Up till now, I've only had only a vague idea what it might entail. I shall have to wait and find out how the next few days develop. 21 March. They are in a hell of a hurry. Today I've got my motorbike and my courier equipment. At the moment, the motorcycle courier section consists of five men, and we are quartered at the regimental headquarters. The HQ, with an Oberst as commander, is located in the basement of a school. The companies are about two kilometers in front of the city and are in action with the enemy all the time. There is a continual coming and going at headquarters, and for the first time I'm experiencing the hectic atmosphere of a regimental command post. Up at the front, the enemy is continually trying to breach our defenses, but he is always thrown back. His heavy artillery is firing without let-up into the village, and quite often the shells land close by. In spite of the fact that the frontline units are constantly in touch by radio, we as couriers are employed where important orders are involved. On the first day, all my couriers are on the road, so I too have to get into the saddle. It's not long before I'm cursing my new assignment. What from the Major's point of view seemed to be an advantageous position turns out to be the exact opposite. I'm exposed to more danger on my motorcycle than I ever was at the front, in a foxhole, fighting the enemy. My men and I have to make our way through soft ground and deep shell craters, all the while dodging exploding ammunition. Once, on this the first day, the ground in front of me suddenly collapsed because of a heavy shell impact, and I and my motorbike dived headlong into the hole. As I groped my way out of the crater, a second heavy shell exploding nearby threw me back into the crater again. I was lucky. A tractor came by and hauled me out with a cable. With the engine roaring and me bent low over the handlebars, I raced towards the front to deliver my orders within the allotted time to the company involved. This is a bit of a problem because the company in the meantime has been forced to move elsewhere as a result of enemy activity, and I have to ask for directions in order to find them. 
Then there is a hellish drive through mortar fire and a rain of bullets, at the end of which my overcoat is shredded. But miraculously, I come away from it all without any serious injury. 26. March. The dangers and exertions of the courier journeys through craters and deep mud is a very risky game of life and death, but I'm involved in it for only five days. During this time, two of my couriers withdraw because of injury, and their replacements have to be instructed. Prior to this, the devil was, as they say, afoot. After a major offensive by our side, which brought no results, the Russians in turn attacked us. Our courier section was heavily involved, and I again cursed the major, who had so grandly announced he would not let me go to the dogs. I have no protection at all on this bloody motorbike, and I am forever dismounting and herring across open fields to get to the units I need to meet up with. As I go to my machine and remove the leather straps on the side pack where I keep my food, I hear the howling of a grenade and immediately afterwards an explosion quite near the school. Splinters bury themselves in the walls. I can hear one of them fizzing through the air and I instinctively duck. Too late. It has my name on it. It makes only a light impact on the rubberized courier coat, but then I feel a hard smack over my left elbow. I can feel the pain and see the blood seeping out of my sleeve, but I suddenly feel freed as if a heavy weight has been lifted from me. And I am aware of the fact that once again, as before, there was a premonition. Better dead than Siberia at ease, I walk back down into the basement and the assistant surgeon gives me a first aid dressing. A large splinter has bored through the flesh above the elbow joint and lodged against the bone. The doctor believes that it has not affected the bone itself. As the major is not at the moment at the command post, I walk over to the regimental commander and in accordance with regulations report my injury. As he gives me his hand, I get the feeling that the Oberst is rather glad for my sake that I have been granted a Heimatschuss. However, some of those present are jealous and obviously envy the fact that, after less than a week here, I can leave the combat zone because of an injury that is not life-threatening. I know because several of the men are calling out after me. Even though they may not show it openly at the command post, I can see that they all have their noses full of the war and certainly only fight because they have, as German soldiers, taken the oath of allegiance to the flag and are sworn not to desert. I can't free myself from this obligation either, although I no longer believe any of the propaganda. I don't think that there's anybody who, at this stage of the war, seriously believes that it will work out in our favor. The fighting which is still being conducted by the troops is just a last stand, a last gasp before defeat. But no one dares to express this view openly. Although I am among friends, I'm not necessarily among the like-minded. For example, on the way here, we saw military policemen along the road who would brutally shoot dissenters or even hang them publicly as a deterrent. One of my couriers is bringing me on the motorbike to the medical station, where shortly afterwards I am loaded into an ambulance which is supposed to take us to Stettin. We aren't safe, however, until we have passed the Oder Bridge, which is outside enemy artillery range. The bridge has been damaged, and so we have to wait until nightfall before we can finally cross it in safety. I feel better now, for the first time in a long while. 27 March. The ambulance brings us to a large military hospital in Stettin, filled to the brim with wounded. The two medics only offload the seriously wounded and those who cannot walk unaided and don't concern themselves with me or two others slightly wounded. With all these hectic goings on, it is impossible for us to find a doctor who can even inspect our injuries. So we doze through the night in a packed corridor and are delighted when, in the morning we are served hot coffee with bread and marmalade. As I am only able to use my right arm, a fellow with a head injury helps me slice the bread. 28 March. Still no one attends to us during the morning, although a Red Cross sister looks after us and gives us some painkillers. She tells us that the city is in the middle of trying to evacuate the wounded to other military hospitals in the West, and that we should therefore try to get away on one of these hospital trains. Away to Hamburg! calls an Obergefreiter from our group wearing a headband. It turns out that he is Detlef Janssen from Bremerhaven. I and several others are in agreement as we have only one wish, to get as far away as possible from the Russian front. Even if we have to be taken prisoner, then we'd much rather it was by the British or the Americans. 29 March. We, along with four other wounded, only get as far as Schwerin before we are stopped by the chain dogs, taken off the train and controlled. They are swine. 
They have no consideration for our injuries and brutally rip the bandages off our wounds, even though we display our injury postings very obviously on our uniforms. When we protest, they fall back on the excuse that it is regulations, and that by doing so they catch deserters and malingerers on a daily basis. We can only grit our teeth and let ourselves be banned to get up again. What annoys us most is that these buggers take themselves so seriously that they take no account of even distinguished frontline soldiers who, after all, have stuck their necks out on their behalf. 10 April. I have been in a military hospital in Gina for the past few days. Everything is quiet and peaceful here. The hospital is located in a former school on the edge of the town. My bandage has been changed and my festering wound cleaned up. The splinter is supposed to be removed because it gives me trouble. The food here is excellent, although the smoking requisites are in rather short supply. We each receive one pack of tobacco. This is hardly enough, so we tried to dilute it with blackberry leaves. It tastes awful. An older soldier who has been here for some time and knows his way about brings us some special herbs which he finds in the forest around here. These are dried and then mixed in with the tobacco so we can stretch our ration. The question is whether our lungs can stand the mixture in the long run. 12 April Literally overnight, an atmosphere of disintegration has come over the hospital. It is going to be evacuated. Today, I am finally able to contact the anti-aircraft unit near Apolda, where my girlfriend Troutle has been serving. Her unit is also in the middle of packing to move off somewhere, so I can only talk with her for a few minutes. We never make contact with each other again. 13 April I have decided to join a group of wounded going to Plauen in Fotland, but here again it is the same problem an overfull hospital. No one worries about us. Everybody is concerned about only one thing, getting to safety. I get to know a gefreiter who comes from Marienbad in the Sudetenland. He tells me that his parents own a small watchmaker's shop there. This conversation reminds me of the soldier who had his leg amputated over Christmas 1942 and who had been my neighbor in the hospital train after the death run at Ritschow. He told me that he came from Marienbad and described the beauty of the place in such glowing terms that, there and then, I made up my mind to get to know it. So as fate spins its web, I now find myself quite close to this lovely health resort. I didn't take long to decide to join the young fair-haired gefreiter and a few others who were also trying to get there. 14. April. Last night we stayed in Eger and received ample marching provisions. We were lucky enough to get a lift from the railway station for a good part of the distance, in a truck that was going to an army supply depot. We walked the rest of the way. The weather has been cool for days, but to make up for that, sunny. The walk, which took us through wonderful pine forests, did me good, and I could breathe the woodland air deep into my lungs. I would have felt good all over had it not been for the pain of my wound, which because of all this increased activity had begun to fester and produce pus. I am therefore thankful when we reach Marienbad, where I can go to a hospital to get treatment. 21 April. The time here passes much too quickly and we would all like to slow the clock down if it were possible. We follow the advance of the enemy front on both sides with the greatest interest. Everyone hopes that the Americans will get here first. Indeed, many want to try to get to the American lines on foot, but they are not near enough yet. Still, everything is quiet in Murray and Bad and roundabout. The frontline units engaged with the enemy have begun to pick up all the soldiers who have finished their convalescence. I am not yet fully recovered, so I'm staying here for more treatment. My wound is still festering. Even the bone itself is apparently deteriorating. Good. I don't have a problem with that because the pain is quite bearable. 29. April. Yesterday, the rumor got about that the Americans will come from the West and possibly be here in the Sudetenland before the Russians. We breathe somewhat more easily and hope that this will come true. Marienbad is wholly a hospital town with no German soldiers stationed here. It will therefore be surrendered to the victors without a fight. However, there are German troops in the outskirts of the town and in the forests. There is talk about some over-enthusiastic group commander putting up some sort of resistance to the American troops. No doubt there will be, in this endgame, some brain-damaged troop leaders who will follow Hitler's orders to the letter and fight to the last round of ammunition. They can do what they like, but I hope they do it alone, without endangering everybody else. To fight the Americans now would not only be crazy, but also a betrayal of all the wounded in this town. It would mean that the U.S. Army would be held up, 
and perhaps not get to Marienbad before the Soviets do. If that's the case, we fear for ourselves and the civilian population. God preserve us. If we have to go to prison, then let's hope it's with the Americans, who, contrary to the Soviets, treat their prisoners in accordance with the terms of the Geneva Convention. 30 April. We can all feel that the end is at hand. Even the food supply has been interrupted, and some have begun to clear the depots. I had my treatment in the hospital today, so I didn't learn until quite late that a uniform depot had been emptied. The soldiers are all running around in new uniforms and boots. I managed to get a pair of brown shoes which were too small for someone else. 1 May. Gefreiter Biernat from our guest house and Obergefreiter Vogel from our room have suddenly started to learn English from a book. They are practicing the words they will use when they meet up with and welcome the Americans. The rest of us don't like what they are doing. We consider the two of them to be turncoats, who after our defeat will immediately offer to work with the enemy in order to perhaps secure some advantage from it. I don't know if you should make judgments. Perhaps they bear no resentment towards our enemies, to whom we will now be delivered without any recourse to law. They were with an anti-aircraft unit, and so never learned about the terrors of the front, lucky them, to have survived the war in this manner, and so they will also be able to forget the war very quickly, unlike me and the many others who have escaped the hellish inferno of the Eastern Front, and now stand in front of a heap of shattered remnants. Within me there is a feeling of indescribable disappointment, and I feel hatred for anything which has to do with this war. For May. Over the last few days, stragglers have been arriving in town in a steady stream, but they are immediately picked up by combat units and driven away. The surrounding forests are now supposed to be full of these stragglers, all fleeing west so as not to fall into the hands of the Russians. Three days ago, we heard about the suicide of Adolf Hitler and Eva Braun. We were shocked that the proud leader had decided to shirk his responsibilities in this cowardly way. But within a couple of hours, he is forgotten. We have our own problems. It is reported that the Russians are not far away and will soon be here. We therefore sleep very uneasily, hearing the roar of artillery fire from both sides getting steadily nearer. 5 May, the day starts cloudless. The sun has warmed up the fresh green trees and the bushes and creates clean shadows on the well-kept footpaths. The grass in the parks and in the gardens is dark green and the hedges along the paths are in full bloom and exuding a wonderful aroma. It is a beautiful spring day, and a wonderful one, not least because news has now reached us that today Marienbad is to be turned over to the Americans without a fight. We therefore await a bloodless entry by American forces within a few hours. We are curious about the Americans. When we hear that they're approaching the town, I go with a group of soldiers along the street and stand, with them, outside a big hospital. Soldiers injured on the Western Front tell me that the Americans are very well equipped, but much more pampered than we are. Without their abundant rations and the huge amount of heavy weapons support they enjoy, they would never have been able to measure up to German soldiers, nor would they have survived in combat like them. But why make comparisons? They are the victors, and we will soon meet them face to face. We can soon hear the rattle and droning of tank tracks drawing slowly nearer. Then we see them. I wonder why it is that so many soldiers are sitting on the tanks as if they are about to open fire. As they come closer, a shiver runs down my back. They look like the Russians, only the uniforms are different. They are kneeling on the tanks and holding their submachine guns at the ready. Their faces are hard, and they have a tense and a watchful glint in their eyes, something I know so well. As they pass our group, they aim their weapons at us. I can see their eyes sparkling, and in their dirty faces I recognize their preparedness to kill but I also recognize fright. Can't they see that we all have bandages on? No one thinks about resisting. Or is it that they have respect for the German soldier and are therefore very nervous? I hope none of these cautious white and black figures with stern faces will go berserk and pull his trigger. We therefore keep quiet and make no movement until they have gone past. Then, all of a sudden, a couple of women and girls are standing there with flowers. The ice is broken, 6 May. Our freedom is over. As of today, orders are that all German soldiers are confined to barracks. You can still hear some exchanges of fire from the forests around Marienbad. Apparently some combat groups there are still resisting. Our hospital is now guarded, and no one is allowed out without a pass. 
The guards fire live ammunition and don't ask questions. In front of our boarding house, a jeep with two black gum-chewing GIs is parked. Tomorrow, the hospital will be checked for SS men and convalescing soldiers. 8 May. Today, we are being transferred from our boarding house to a large military hospital with the posh name Bellevue. Yesterday, the Americans transferred many convalescents and soldiers from the Waffen-SS onto trucks and took them off somewhere. The result is that the hospitals are no longer so full. 9 May. There no longer is any salt in our food. The thin soup tastes terribly flat. People say that the Czechs have confiscated the salt. We assume that it is to punish the loser. When I look out of the window, it makes me wonder where all those Czech soldiers have come from. In the meantime, the end of the war has come about with the official signing of the surrender by Gross Admiral Dunitz. 13 May. Everything is suddenly happening much too quickly and we've no time to think. Given time, I and many others would undoubtedly have tried to escape. Yes, there were murmurings about being turned over to the Russians, but everyone hoped for a fair deal from the Americans, that they would not be so unfeeling as to turn their prisoners over to the Red Army. But this morning, when we're called into formation in the hospital and wait for transport, we know that our hopes have been dashed. On the way to a barracks, we meet up with a number of women and girls who have heard about our move and are looking for members of their family and friends. They wave frantically to us, but none of us waves back. We're all sitting on the trucks in silence with pale and stony faces, unable to comprehend how our hopes of a fair imprisonment can have changed overnight to a terrible, deadly future. Traveling to Russia means nothing less than imprisonment in Siberia. A terrible word. It hammers away inside my head. Can the Americans begin to imagine what the word Siberia means? Do they understand the fear, horror, and hopelessness that this word conjures up? We who have fought against the Soviets, we can imagine what awaits us in Siberia. In the barracks area, we receive our first taste of what lies ahead. We are led into rooms furnished with beds comprising bare wooden planks, with just a blanket on each. We are still guarded by American GIs, but all this changes when a goods train pulls in at the end of the barracks and some Russian soldiers emerge. I shiver. The very faces and uniforms that I have always feared. I had thought that I could forget all about them, but now I know that I can't. If I'm not seeing them in person before me, I'll be seeing them in my nightmares. We have to line up, and a translator comes over to us. He demands that everyone who was in the SS step forward. Only a few men do so. Next to be called forward are those who have only fought on the Eastern Front. He warns us to own up, since our units can easily be checked. I just keep quiet. My brain is working feverishly as I try to figure out a way of getting out of this. I am quite determined not to allow myself be taken to Siberia. I'd rather get shot running away, as happened to two other soldiers who tried to flee when they entered the camp. 14. May I know from previous experience that I get a fever every time my wounds get infected, so I reckon I have to organize a new infection. The grenade splinter created a sort of little tunnel from the point of entry to the bone, through which pus would drain. A thin layer of skin had now grown over this hole, and it is this new skin that I now have to open up. I managed to lay my hands on a rusty nail. I realized that things could turn serious, but in my desperation I would rather die from blood poisoning than be sent to the hell of Siberia. I choke back the pain and puncture the recently healed skin with the nail until the blood oozes out, and in order to speed up the infection I poke several centimeters of gauze bandage into it as well. 15. May. My plan has worked. During the night I had terrible pains in my arm, but this afternoon my head is hot and I go down with a fever. As I make my way to the medical station, I am dizzy and start to black out. The medic puts me on a stretcher straight away and gives me an examination. All I can remember after that is telling the ambulance driver to get me to the hospital in the Bayerischer Hof, which he does. From that point, everything is a blank. 17 May. This morning, as I wake up, I am bathed in sweat. I have been having nightmares about the war and all its horrors. Gradually, it dawns on me where I am. I'm lying in a clean bed in the hospital in the Bayerischer Hof with three other wounded, in a light and airy room. A friendly nurse is bringing coffee. She gives me a cup. It tastes like bean coffee, but is thin and flat, as if it has just been reheated. 
As I try to sit up, I note how weak I am and that my left arm is swathed in a thick bandage from elbow to upper arm. A doctor comes along. He asks me why I am out of bed. I wonder if he's the one who treated me. As if reading my thoughts, he says, that was a hell of a length of bandage stuck in your wound. I had to make a long incision above the elbow. I just caught you in time. Another two hours and you wouldn't have made it. I go to say something, but he hushes me up and says with a twinkle in his eye, It's okay. I looked in your passbook and I know why you did it. 3. June. The time has flown. The hospital has been gradually emptying, and there are now only a few left needing treatment. The food has improved, but we don't get tobacco any longer. Some of the patients have got into contact with the outside world and managed to get hold of American tobacco every so often rescued from ashtrays by German employees working for the Americans. Personally, I've traded in my decorations, one at the time, to the Americans for Lucky Strike, Camel, or Chesterfield cigarettes. Both white and black GIs are crazy about German medals, and they'll probably boast about them when they get back home. They even come to us in the hospital here and try to outbid each other in cartons of cigarettes for our awards. What use are all these trimmings to me? They have never meant very much, although other peoples do to them. I've already said why. And now, since we've lost the war, they are only worth their weight in the metal they are made from. Best of all, I am given a couple of cartons of American cigarettes for them, helping me, as a heavy smoker, get through a difficult time. 6 June. Unpleasant things generally take you by surprise. So it is today. Just after breakfast, I am told that I am being discharged from the hospital and will be picked up by a truck around noon to be taken to a prisoner of war camp. Although my wound has healed, my arm is still pretty useless and I have to wear a sling. The open truck in which we are driven takes only about half an hour to reach the camp. The camp is really nothing more than a barbed wire enclosure, a more or less grassless field with some American guards patrolling around the outside. Every now and then they flick their half-smoked cigarette butts over the fence and chuckle when some miserable-looking German soldier rushes over, picks them up, and then starts smoking them, passing them round from one man to the other. Many of them wait by the fence to get hold of a cigarette end, and sometimes the guard will get some entertainment by taking out a cigarette, lighting it, and then after a few puffs deliberately throwing it on the ground and grinding it out. It makes you sick. 11 June. Every day a handful of prisoners whose home is in the American-occupied zone or who can give the address of their family there, are released. In this latter case, this is specifically added for those whose home, as indicated in their soldier's passbook, is in a Soviet-occupied area. As I can provide this proof, I get my release documents today, and I am now walking with a group of discharged soldiers past the Black Guard, through the gate, into freedom. After a few meters, I stop and look back at the dirty, miserable-looking figures camped on what looks a bit like a plowed field. For the first time it dawns on me that everything has actually gone quite smoothly. I could have vegetated here for ages inside this barbed wire enclosure, so I thank God that I can put this imprisonment behind me. It was not just the filth and dirt or the stupid waste of time, but much worse, the humiliation and the degradation I have had to endure from every lousy guard. Now I'm released from all of this. I'm free. And with every step I remove myself further from the camp, I free myself from the burden which for the last few weeks has weighed me down. Gradually I begin to rebuild my hopes, and I start to look at my surroundings in a new light. I look at my old army-issue trousers, the bottoms of which are now all frayed. They don't really match the new brown lace-up shoes I am wearing. I'm glad I got hold of the new shoes that time in the depot. Who knows when I might have found a new pair. Just as I am about to clean them up with a rag from my pocket, a dark shadow appears. I look up and am startled. In front of me stands a Czech soldier, demanding in broken German that I give him my new shoes. I simply ignore him and try to get away, but he takes his Russian Kalashnikov and pokes the barrel right in my chest. I can see his hate fill at ease and know that he will not hesitate to pull the trigger. I am his enemy and he is the victor. I belong to him, and he can shoot me if the fancy takes him. So I hastily pull off my shoes and give them to him. In the meantime, the Czech had also taken off his worn-out shoes, which he throws in front of me. With a satisfied grin, he pulls mine on and marches away. How I would love to run after this rotten bugger to get my shoes back. But he was armed, 
and he wanted some revenge. There was nothing for it but to grit my teeth and put on his shoes, if I didn't want to run around in my socks. This meeting with the Czech militia proved to me very clearly how helpless the loser is and how deep the hate and the thirst for vengeance reside in those who were our enemies. Buena caput. The fervent wish of many people has come to pass, and the war is finally over. But will it also be over in their hearts? How long will it be until the hate and the craving for revenge is buried? Yes, I know there are people who, despite the atrocities, have put aside hatred and seek closer bonds with their enemies. It is they who give me new hope. But when will people realize that it is possible for any of us to be manipulated by domineering and power-crazed individuals who know how to motivate the masses in order to misuse them for their own ends? While they keep well out of the way, in safety, they have no hesitation in brutally sacrificing their people in the name of patriotism. Will mankind ever stand together against them? Or are those who died in the fighting dead forever, and will the reasons they gave their lives be forgotten? I will never be able to forget those I knew. They are the constant reminders that I was very privileged to survive them. It is no less than my obligation to tell their story.